Today's episode of the Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast on the Unsettled Media Podcast Network is brought to you by Sensory Friendly Solutions. Discover sensory friendly solutions for daily life. To learn more, head to sensoryfriendly.net. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast. This is episode three with Renee Warren. Renee is the founder of We Wild Women. She's an award-winning entrepreneur with one successful exit. She has a $1 million plus PR agency and is a podcast host of a podcast called Into the Wild. I think you'll really enjoy it. She's very open with her personal experience, her family experience of sensory overload, how she is turning her son's experience of sensory overload into a superpower. She reflected on what entrepreneurs are facing right now, especially female entrepreneurs. She's an authority on the subject, and we really appreciate her coming on the podcast. This is episode three of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast with Renee Warren. Renee Warren, welcome to the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to chat about this. So... I'm going to do the COVID check-in that we all seemingly have to do with each other because it's been a year. But before we get there, do you mind just introducing yourself for people who haven't interfaced with your work before now? Yeah, for sure. So I am Renee Warren. I am from a small town in Northern Ontario. So I know Mm -hmm. country life. And I've been an entrepreneur most of my life, having started a restaurant when I was 17 years old. Doing my own consulting. Yeah, 17. My mom told me to go get a job and I said, I'll start a business because I thought at 17 that entrepreneurs didn't work a lot and they made a lot of money. So why (laughs) would I get a job working for somebody else? And so my entrepreneur journey started then and it hasn't ended. I went to school. I had one little job in Toronto for a couple of years, but outside of that, I've always just run my own business. And for many reasons, but um, part of it is just the freedom to be able to do what I want, working with the people that I that I love. And sure. right now, this year, I actually launched a company called We Wild Women. So I coach first time female entrepreneurs in launching their dream business. So my wow, mission in life, yeah, my mission in life is to help more women start their dream business because I believe that there needs to be more entrepreneurial, more women in business and more women in a position of power because we need more women leaders. And so one of the things that I thought about during the pandemic is all the things you're saying, I wonder what stays permanently. And I wonder if our relationship to work and thereby our relationship to our mission becomes more healthy in some way, because even Mm -hmm. I've seen, so I've been a full-time entrepreneur since May. Um, so I'm I'm extremely excited to be on this journey, but at the same time, I feel a kinship with my mission that I didn't feel prior to doing it full time. You know what I mean? And you're right. You you feel like you're living the way you should be living. So doing a podcast or, or implementing a business like We Wild Women, it's just allowing you to get closer to that thing you always knew you were going to do. Yeah. Um, so... COVID aside, I feel like this was always a calling of mine, but I only Mm. really discovered this last October. Um, But with COVID, I will say there's a lot of things that are going to change. And a perfect example would be the healthcare system. So in Canada, Mm -hmm. we have an incredible healthcare system, but a lot of general practitioners and some doctors have chosen to do uh, phone calls for their consultations with their patients, which normally you would have to go to the office, which, you know, most things can be discussed over the phone. If it's a more serious matter, obviously seeing a doctor is important. But for mm-hmm. me, I've had a couple instances where I've needed, you know, medication for a strep throat or whatever. And I didn't even go and physically see a doctor. 
I took pictures or videos of the issue, sent it in over email. They right. faxed the prescription to the pharmacy. And then within two hours of diagnosis, I was already taking my first sip of my amoxicillin. <laughs> so <laughs> that, I mean, that is just an example of how things I know are going to progress. And I think mm -hmm. um, people working remotely which has been, people said it was a fad, but I mean, this remote work really started 10 years ago. And sure. I know this because I worked with a lot of technology startups out of the Valley when I ran my agency and they were all about remote work and because it allowed them to access the best talent pool anywhere in the world. So you can have the best developer in India because you can connect over Zoom and, mm -hmm. you know, work together remotely. You can have the best marketer in Australia because why not? So mm. that being said, there's also this thing now in education because of COVID and that, that is interesting. That is, I mean, that's a discussion in and of itself, but totally, um, things are definitely changing. And I think a lot of things for the better, it's just, it unfortunately had to take a whole massive shift for us to be able to appreciate what we can do remotely. Mm. The point of this podcast project and why podcasts are seemingly an incredible way to achieve what I've been calling internet era leverage is because it allows you to drill in to a specific issue and invite a community in to listen. I've almost, I've sometimes said that a really great podcast or a lot of mediocre podcasts, but a really great podcast feels almost like a guilty pleasure. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's a conversation you can't believe you were invited to, but all of a sudden you have front row seats. It's an yeah. incredible tool for a business to achieve leverage. And so the point of this podcast project, a really fascinating implication is how do we develop strategies to reduce the noise, the mm -hmm. busy, the bright, mm -hmm. the confusion of the modern era and how you describe working from home. I wonder if, does it allow us to have or maybe it allows us to decide what our relationship to work is. Mm -hmm. We now know the nine to five is totally arbitrary. A dress code is a symbol of mistrust. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. a benchmark. It's mistrust of your employees. Does working from mm -hmm. home, although I know it's challenging for parents and you're a parent and we're going to talk about that, but does it allow us to conceive our own relationship to what healthy working is? I think so. Um, However, you definitely need those boundaries because the unfortunate thing that people that are not motivated um, can find easy ways and easy excuses to not be focused on the task at hand. However, it also allows you to have the flexibility. Like yesterday, I had to bring my son to the dentist and I don't have to call on anybody to go. And I'm really hoping that employers also see this as kind of the new era and um so yeah, there's, there's boundaries that you have to set. However, I think what it does is it opens up a whole new playing field for people that, um, you know, there's all of these, all of these things that society have created like anxiety and stress because of being overloaded with noise and sounds and lights and things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes stepping out of the house produces this incredible fear or sense of anxiety and you show up to work and you're not the person you could be. And when I lived in mm. Toronto, I would have to physically go downtown to my office and everything I did was on a computer, but I had to be in an mm. office. It would take me an hour to get there by subway. It was always stinky, hot, cramped. I was always hungry and tired. And by the time I got to the office, it's like, man, I just wasted an hour, which agitated me. There was little inspiration in the commute. Mm. And now you're forcing me to do a job that I could have easily done at home and already been at least an hour in work. And I remember those cold days and I would call in and say, listen, the subway is not working very well. Can I work from home? And they said, sure. And my productivity was through the roof, through yeah. the roof. And I got yeah. to be in my pajamas all day. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to, you get to conceive of your own space. Like you, you mentioned the commute, not being inspiring and there's sensory overload in the commute mm. within and of itself, but you don't get to conceive of your own space. You don't get to conceive of your own schedule. So some people are early birds. Some people do their maker hours first thing and some people do their maker hours at night. I just wonder if our relationship to work becomes more healthy. And you, you mentioned strategies to create those mm -hmm. barriers. Have you created strategies 
personally and within your business? I know you're a coach, a successful one. What kinds of barriers or what kinds of strategies to conceive of those barriers have you created for yourself so that you know it's time to do this and it's time to do that? Well, so during COVID, we had to restructure some of our house and mm. the, what has now become my office is used to be my youngest son's bedroom, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, which is fine because my boys are the very, very close in age and they share a bunk bed and they love it. Um, but I always joke that after my morning coffee, I'm like, Hey, bye guys going to the office. Heard the commute wasn't so bad today as a mm. joke, but that mm. for me signals, okay, you're going to work. And I'm one wall away from the laundry room. I'm one wall away from the kitchen and the dishes in the sink, but this is where I need to be. And yeah. part of what I do in coaching actually is we really clearly define our target audience. So you wake up in the morning and you go to work because you know who you're serving and why you're serving them because these people need you. And so for me, we help define the target audience, say, okay, this for me, my, my ideal customer, her name is entrepreneur, Emily. And I envision her every morning. It's like the days that I'm like, Oh, you know, maybe I do laundry. I correct myself and say, no, Emily needs me today. So I have to go create for her. I have to show up for her. And it could be if you're, you know, a stay at home mom or a parent, it's like you're showing up for your child or you're showing up for person X, Y, Z. So the boundary is the person I'm showing up for, because if you're an entrepreneur and a good entrepreneur, it's never about the money. It's about your mission and who you're serving. Mm. And so you have to show up every day for that person. And the money comes. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if we all need someone to help us get there. Because one of the things that COVID has revealed in my life is you could either you could either double down on the fear and anxiety and overwhelm of the time. And that manifests itself in really negative ways, which we've explored on the podcast already. Or you can double down and say, this is an opportunity. Uh, this is an opportunity for me and my family. And I know that first and foremost, this is a healthcare crisis. So we need to be sensitive to that. But paradoxically, this could be a time where you double down on things like family values, things like reducing the noise and overwhelm, reducing your media diet or totally revolutionizing your media diet. Are we, are we in information overload right now? Are we just oh, being bombarded by information? 100%. Yes. Yeah. And it took me up until about a month ago to realize that a lot of, so I have such mistrust in the media and mm -hmm. I've actually taken the kin to looking at such polarizing opinions because I feel like the the truth is in the middle. So mm. I'll have to take President Trump into consideration, but his opinion versus somebody who is a complete liberal. It's like they're so far on the other end of the spectrum, but what's in the middle, it might be the truth. Um, mm. But the media, it just in my opinion, I think is probably 15% correct. <laughs> mm. I mean, mm. even the weather is... 15% correct when you look at the, so when we're the weather forecast. The media diet, yeah. So when we're not scaling our media diet, we're letting things into our system that one, don't serve us, but also may or may not be true. No. And that's the thing is we, we connect and attach ourselves to the opinion of people that we respect. And that opinion can largely be uneducated, uninformed, unexperienced, and they're just saying whatever they want to say, whoever they is. And then all of a sudden you believe that to be the truth. So there's a lot of talk about, um, like, I know this is about sensory overload, but in terms of media, there's a lot of talk about like COVID. And lately I'm like, maybe this is actually just a political play and it's not true. Nothing that we're reading is true. Mm. And all of a sudden there's all these people that have suffered, lost their jobs and all these things that are happening because it's all about politics. I don't know. So these are like, this is the the overload. And when you start down these rabbit holes about listening to social media and these people that are talking about whatever, it is degrading. And mm. it, it for me, it's it's probably the worst thing you should be doing at any point in the day is looking at the news. Even my husband's like, why are you reading that stuff? I'm like, oh, this is actually comical <laughs> right now. Yeah. This is yeah. funny. Um, but yeah, I think it's the best 
the best place for me to be because I'm a very sensitive person for sounds. Mm. And that's why, like, for me, the uh, subway commute to work was probably the worst thing I should be doing. Um, some people love it. They get energized by the people. They listen to their podcast on the episode um, mm-hmm. and it inspires them. I can't. There's there's too much going on. So I, everything, I can't process out all the noise and the stuff that's happening. Um, and that's the thing with media too, is there's some people that can read something and be like, oh, whatever, that's a thing, an opinion I don't agree with and move on with their day. But there's some people that read this stuff or see it or hear it and all of a sudden it consumes them. And then they're not yeah. productive. And like, maybe it's not even the truth. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the same way as you in the sense that I've described this in the past as my empathy problem. Mm. I had to really work hard at creating strategies to when I internalize something like that. So if I, if I turn on the news today and saw the COVID stats for Florida, my aunt and uncle live in Florida, all of a sudden my, 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 what I call my empathy problem has brought me to a state of overwhelm where I'm not focused. Uh, I'm not emotionally stable enough to be doing the things that I want to be doing and at a high level. How do you deal with that? You you said you're a sensitive person. How do you, what have, what strategies have you conceived to be able to deal with that, to be able to shut these things out above and beyond just turning it off, which may, which may actually be the solution. Oh yeah. No, sometimes you just have to, you have to turn it off. Um, for me, it's, it's being okay and feeling those emotions too. It's okay to be frustrated and angry and curious, but know that there you have to. There's a limit to that. And like the moment you see that your own energy and your own thoughts are shifting more negatively, it's time to shut that stuff down. And the same could be said with people in your life that are not supporting or contributing. It's time to take them out of the equation. Like just friends that are just not good for you or people in your life, family, unfortunately, that might not be serving you. It's the same thing. It's the same emotion. So whether it's negative media, the news Mm. or people in your life, there's still signals for um, things that are not serving you. And it is noise. It is Mm -hmm. sensory overload because what emotion do those people and does the news create if it's for you, then that's great. But if it's never for you in a sense that you might have people that are never supporting you as much as you are trying to reciprocate, it's time to just cut them out. And Mm. what I've done, um, social media wise is we wake up at 5am at our house, my husband and I every day, (laughs) regardless of the day of the week. And some mornings are super productive. We get to work, we're in our five minute journal and drinking our coffee. Things are amazing. And then some days we're just like, it's not, it's not one of those days. And my favorite app on my, on the phone is the weather network. (laughs) I love, (laughs) I love storms. I've always been fascinated by weather, tornadoes and hurricanes. I just love that stuff. Um, I don't love the devastation. I just, I'm very curious about weather. So Mm. that actually makes me happy. So when there's a storm, I'm like, Ooh, like how fast is the wind? How much rain is there? This is so cool. The ocean swells. Um, that fills me up, but for other people, it could be like very alarming. So, we we set boundaries and I don't have my phone next to me in bed. It's across the bedroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never, ever, ever check news or ask charged questions or anything that could affect my sleep before I go to bed. And so we are on, so my husband's doing the 75 hard thing now where you go 75 days, two workouts a day. You don't eat any crap, drink, no alcohol, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So he's on day nine. Um, and I said, Hey, can I add something to this? And he's like, sure. Why not? It's already hard as it is. And I'm like, no television in our room for 75 days. Wow. Okay. And he's like, okay. Cause we have a TV in our room and yep. that has allowed us. Cause part of the 75 hard too is reading 10 pages a day, at least. Mm. I'm like, how perfect is this now? You can read your 10 pages before bed. Cause there's nothing to watch. Um, mm-hmm. so in, taking out the things that would normally make me upset or worried or scared, like social media and the news, especially before bed, allows me to sleep better. And when you have a good night's sleep, you wake up, you have this momentum. You're like, "Uh -uh, I'm not checking the news right now. I'm not going to go on social media because I feel good. 
Mm. And the mm. less I check it, the better I feel. So what is the point on checking it? <laughs> and is the feeling you're describing when you're in that zone, is that fe a feeling of alignment? Because I know when I get into a mode and we're going to talk about modern entrepreneurs, because I know that's your bag. When I'm out of alignment is when I'm allowing all of those sensory overloads to come into my life. But when I'm in alignment, I'm healthy. I'm craving simplicity. My work is a high level. You just feel that sense of, like you said, your, your ideal customer, Emily, yeah. you feel in alignment with that customer mm -hmm. and you think, okay, I'm ignoring all of these things. I'm in alignment. And you seem like you've, you develop strategies to create alignment. Is, is that what that is all heading towards? Oh, absolutely. But here's the thing is I call them down cycles in coaching is you can never always be in alignment. Stuff happens mm. in life. Um, people get sick, things happen, right? You lose business. This, you can't avoid it. And you might become misaligned, but these down cycles are necessary. They're necessary for you to, because it's an experience, you're learning, something's happening, you're growing. So you can, as Tony Robbins says, life is either happening to you or for you. And it's really uh -huh. hard to fathom that. It's like you just got in a car accident and now you have like $5,000 of damage on your car. It's like, how is this happening for me? But there's always mm. a lesson in these things. So life happens for you. So on these down cycles, when you're not aligned, it's like, what's the message? What am I learning here? Why am I going through this? Every single time that you're down and getting kicked and you get back up again, you're stronger and you become mm -hmm. even more aligned. Things become more clear afterwards if you choose to see it as a gift. Mm, that's beautiful. Renee, before we dig into the modern entrepreneur, can I read something that you wrote? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, I, I should say you actually, you, you quoted, um, the great Stevie Nicks mm, in saying yeah. that I believe that if you are gracious, you have won the game. How does that apply to the modern entrepreneur? Yes. She's my favorite. I hope to meet her someday. So if you don't know Stevie Nicks, she is the French singer for Fleetwood Mac. Um, mm. so if you're gracious, you've already won the game means that it doesn't matter what life throws at you, just be humble and kind. So our, our family motto and, and word of the year is kill them with kindness. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter who's, who owes you what, or who's disowned you, just be kind. And the more you can even just force yourself to feel those emotions and be kind, the more you realize that when things or people happen to you, it's never, ever about you. It's about them. So when you're mm. gracious, it's like someone's rude to you. They cut you off or whatever happens. They don't pay the bill that you've been you know, hoping for. It's never about you. And I think Rachel Hollis said this. Um, her quote is, other people's opinion of you is none of your business. And it took me forever to figure out. I'm like, of course, it's my business what other people think of me. But it's mm. not because it's a reflection of them. Now they've done studies and I don't know exactly this, but you can actually show somebody a paper that's white and a paper that's blue. And someone might say that the blue paper is pink and it's like, no, 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 it's clearly blue, but they see it as pink. And it's because whatever's going on in their head, I'm not saying they're colorblind, but they think it's pink for whatever reason. Someone made them believe that it's pink. Mm -hmm. So this Stevie Nicks quote is if you're gracious, as much as you can be gracious, you've already won the game. I think about like the most successful people I know in life that have all facets of their life doing very well are the kind people. They're gracious. Yeah. The givers. Mm -hmm. I think you're totally right. Renee, what is the modern entrepreneur up against right now? And I'm going to introduce perhaps a good place to start. It, it seems to me as someone running an internet based business, and I know you are as well, it really it's people based, but it it's, happens on the internet the ROI on your attention has mm. never been more obvious, but it's never been easier to be distracted. That's the paradox of the modern era. Mm -hmm. Is that what the modern entrepreneur is really up against? And when this was crystallized for me, and then I would love to hear your reflection, when COVID got serious 
and every company seemingly transitioned overnight to producing PPE. (laughs) Just because PPE is what the market needs right now does not mean that you should be producing the PPE. If you're a vodka distillery that transitioned into hand sanitizer because you have all the tools at your disposal, fine. I mean, that's a, that's a semi pivot. That's, that's fine. You're appealing to the market, but if you're just a retail business and you pivot overnight to producing PPE, there will be a time where that need goes away and your distraction will not have served you. What's the modern entrepreneur up against? I mean, you're coaching a lot of these businesses. Yeah. So the first word that came to mind was noise and Mm. there's just a lot of noise out there. Um, so it's, it's cutting through that clutter and, you know, think about any online businesses that started now, if you put them back 10 years ago and they had the strategies today, they would crush it. But there's so many other people doing a lot of the same things. So mm. I look at it, how many people live in the world, right? You're defining your customer, your ideal customer, and it all comes back to that. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're like, oh my gosh, there's 10 people that just started exactly what I'm doing. I always say, hey, look at it as market validation, but go out and be the best that you can serving the people that need you. So yes, there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing now. And I've heard it over the years. Well, who needs another business coach? I'm like, well, in my opinion, everybody who's an entrepreneur needs a business coach. So however many entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. there out there should be how many business coaches there are. (laughs) Right. And, and the thing about yeah. a coach is it's a very personal connection. So whether it's me coaching one-on-one in a mastermind or a digital program, it's you're still learning from me and my experience and the community I've created. Um, so cutting through the noise really is just having the most useful solution to your ideal customer's problem. So a lot of what I do is idea validation, market validation, customer validation work with my customers. Like you can come up with any idea. I always said it, you know, in the nineties or the eighties, they sold the pet rock. People bought a rock and it was a pet. I'm like, wow, (laughs) someone was so smart to actually market a rock and make money from it. Uh Um, So if they can do that, then you can do anything. It's just, how are you unique? And the other thing too, especially with um, like, there's, there's this whole filter that I I work with my entrepreneurs around the patriarchy and Mm. somebody's work that I follow really closely is Dr. Valerie Rehm. She's the author of the book, The Patriarchy Stress Disorder. And what she talks about in that book is how the patriarchy hasn't been serving anybody. Mm. And a lot of the things we believe in life, religion, family, running a business, politics, have all have the foundation of coming from the power of a white man. Mm. So it's white man's privilege that have created the foundation of the Western world. And Mm. this is my opinion. So, I mean, by all means, if you don't agree with me, that's okay. But this is where my work comes from. And part of that is this fascinating ideal that we have to run a business that's going to make $10 million because otherwise you're not considered a good entrepreneur. And I call BS on that. (laughs) I call BS on the need to have to scale your business to some part absurd amount that you're going to either go public Mm. or be acquired. And yes, there are instances where this is very logical and makes sense. Um, But especially for women, when you step into the the ring of entrepreneurship that is very male dominated, the rules and foundation of what it means to be an entrepreneur were created by men. It's tough. And so we have to recreate these rules and recreate these beliefs around, especially as women, what it means to be an entrepreneur and what it means to be successful in that ring, because it's not necessarily about making millions and billions of dollars. It's about the impact you have. It's on the problem you're solving for the people that you're serving. Mm. So redefining what success means for us is a strategy to reduce the noise because it allows us to center. It allows us to, to maintain our mission. Yeah. And for me, I, so I live with a high performing um, husband. (laughs) He's Mm -hmm. a, his goal is to have a private jet one day and he believes it. And you know what, when he says it, I believe it too. And he yeah. wants to make an audacious amount of money, like billions of dollars. And I'm like, that's amazing. That is not my dream. 
And uh-huh. I don't want to have to be in that position mentally and physically to achieve that. I can do it. Sarah Blakely of Spanx did it. There are very mm-hmm. few women that have done it. However, I don't want that. And the moment I told myself, I don't want that, I already minimized my dreams just because he wants it. Now I feel like I'm supposed to do it. I'm not saying this for my husband. I'm just saying for entrepreneurs in general. So my goal, my mission in life has little to do with revenue. And there's another big red flag most entrepreneurs throw up is like, oh, well, it should be revenue. Like, no, it's Mm -hmm. about impact. So my mission is to help inspire, educate, and motivate over a million women to start their dream business. Mm. However, I do the how is not important. It's the why. Mm. And the moment I was like, that is my thing, right? Then all the noise, it's almost like you're walking through a crowd of people and you're not too sure what it is, your thing, and you find it. It's like everyone steps aside and leaves space for you to walk towards your goal. And so how I get there, I don't know. It doesn't, that is insignificant to the why, because I've already said Mm. it, maybe I've already touched thousands of women. So I'm one step, one step towards that goal. So understanding your why, and it doesn't have to be perfect and it changes over the course of your life, allows you to cut out the noise, allows you to be super focused on who you're serving and why you're serving them. Yeah, that's great advice. Renee, what has been your personal experience or your family's experience with sensory friend with the sensory friendly world or sensory overload? It can be this year or in a particularly trying yeah. moment in your life. We really want to encourage vulnerability because we know the listeners looking for those tactics and those strategies and those tools. So, I mean, tell us a little bit about what that experience has been like. Okay, so you do know the two real fears of humans, right? You know what they are? There's mm-hmm. only two. Okay. You know what they are? Tell me. It's the fear of falling and the uh-huh. fear and the fear of loud noises. Okay. And so it's already in our DNA to be fearful of these things. So everything else is learned behavior. Everything. So when we talk about sensory overload, like this is a total different conversation in terms of entrepreneurship, but my oldest son, Max is Mm -hmm. an incredible little boy. Um, the first moment of recognizing his sensitivity came from my sister-in-law who was running a daycare and watched him. So Mm -hmm. he went to daycare when he was five weeks old, um, because I had to go back to work and you know, the first little while was an adjustment. He's a newborn. So you're like, oh, babies cry. They do these things. And then over time, we realized that he was just sensitive, quote. And I, and I hated throwing a label at him. But I'm like, if I had to describe him, this is what he is. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, he's sensitive. And she agreed. And what I've noticed is he is hyper aware of everything that's happening. And we have right. brought him to, to see child psychologists and learning centers and all. there's nothing wrong with him. He is just unable to block out all of the stimuli. So there's this thing called the singular gyrate. Oh my gosh, I don't know. It's part of the brain. Essentially mm-hmm. in young development for Max, it was under underdeveloped. And so as you and I are talking, there could be things happening outside or a sound in the background or a smell or something that we're able to dismiss in order to focus on this conversation. He couldn't mm. do that. And so all this stuff was going into his brain and he's like, what do I do with this? And then he would get agitated and lash out. So we've been working on this. Um, but it's definitely helped me become a, a better mother um, a better mm-hmm. entrepreneur and understanding, oh my gosh, like this is a thing that's happening with my child. It's happening with a lot of other people. And as I'm coaching other women, they say, oh, this is a thing that's happening to me or my kids. And so, you know, as a parent, it's like, well, what, what can we do to help, help this become Max's superpower? And, yeah. and it has, but, um, you know, going back to those two great fears, it's, it's really interesting because loud noises startle him. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's really, and for me, it's like, 
I've also been afraid of loud noises. I don't like loud noises. And it's funny because my mm. husband speaks very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and yeah. And so it's, it's, you have to, here's the, here's the thing is you have to create the environment in your mm. home office, in your home at work, wherever it is, that is going to work for you. So if you've ever been in an environment that wasn't in your favor, it's typically loud open spaces which, you know, the open concept office is another thing I think is going to change because how can you yep. get anything done? I don't, I don't yep. understand. Right. I, like, I haven't gotten it from the start. <laughs> right. Like Google made it cool, but it's like, I don't know guys. <laughs> um, anyway, so I hope that answers your question. It does. And, and you put it so beautifully that facilitating a quality of life for Max that it allows it to become his superpower, maybe his, mm-hmm. his hyper awareness of the world makes him one of the, the, the next best writers or next best podcasters or someone that observes something of the world that allows it to be his superpower. And I think that's, well, a- and he remembers, it's insane. He remembers everything when he was mm. just turning seven, they did. So at his learning center, they did a cognitive memory test on him and he had the memory of a 16 year old. Wow. And I'm like, what does that mean? He remembers like, Oh, just, just stuff like people and places and maps. Like I'll be driving to a place we visited maybe once or twice and he'll go, Oh no, mama, you were supposed to turn back there. And I'm like, how do you know this? Wow. <laughs> yes. And he remembers, he remembers situations and scenarios. Like the other day, he he asked him, in. yeah, he's like, Hey mama, I really want to wear those gray pants. You know, the, the grape, I'm like, I don't know what gray pants you're talking about. The ones I was wearing last year when we did this photo shoot and we were playing football in the backyard. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Renee, you've been so generous with your time. Our final question, we want to send people out to the world to actually go and do, create that excellent quality of life in this noisy, busy, bright era. Let's recap for one minute, whether it's with Max and his quality of life, whether it's with yourself, whether it's with your ideal customers, what's a strategy you use to reduce the noise of the current era? And we'll end on this. Mm. Wow. That's a, that's a tough question. So I think now my answer to this question would be, be curious Um, be curious because you need to understand that maybe, maybe the noise is actual loud noise to you. Noise Mm -hmm. could also be the media. And so the curiosity around consuming content, social media, media is don't, if something really angers you or frustrates you or hurts you, don't assume that content is, should be taken as face value that there's there's other ways of understanding what's happening. And so that has helped me during this very emotional past six months, especially um, during COVID, during the Black, Black Lives Matter movements, mm-hmm. is really being curious has helped me understand people's perspective and know that there's a lot of people that say things and do things because they're suffering. Mm-hmm. And I think just knowing that allows you to become a healer, whether it's for yourself, your family, or your friends, um, it allows you to also be more gracious. Yeah. Renee, where can we find your work? Where can we find the podcast? Let's point people to what you're doing. Yes. So you can go to wewildwomen.com mm-hmm. and you can find the podcast there. Also on iTunes or Spotify, anywhere you can find a podcast. It's called Into the Wild. And I interview high-performing female entrepreneurs to understand where they started and how they become successful entrepreneurs and women. Renee Warren, thank you so much for being on the Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Crystal, we're back for our reflection period of episode three. And we were laughing before we started recording. It's been a day, it's been a week, but this is our time to reflect on where we are with the podcast. So this is episode three, Renee Warren. Give me some thoughts. What what are your, what's your initial feedback on this? 
Yeah, I was really, um, I'm going to say just what Renee said, um, how she said it, and the things she shared uh, really made me reflect, Matt, on our, our podcast uh, series as a whole, this this first uh, season, and the the fact that you, you know we started with uh, Dr. Sarah Gander as a pediatrician, and then we had uh, Maureen as a mom um, and as a you know a, a driving force in autism awareness, um, and then and then we brought Renee, who spoke to us also as as a mother, as a woman, as a as a partner with her husband Dan, as a coach to other women, specifically women entrepreneurs, as an entrepreneur herself. And I really, it, uh, so I really, it really made me think about the diversity in the conversations that we're right. having, right? Yep. And that, um, and sort of why are we doing that? And, and you and I sort of know who's coming and what's coming mm. and that our, our conversations, we're really talking to different people with different uh, lens views on all, almost all things sensory, right? And, um, and that, and I, I, I was thinking about that and sort of why are we doing that? We are doing that. Um, and that sometimes when we have a, a problem, we, we like to find people who um, sort of res- resonate with our problem and who are, who are just like us with, with the same problem and the same circumstances. That feels very comfortable. And we think, okay, we can, we can learn from people who experience exactly what we experience in the way we experience it. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of use myself as, a, as an example. So I have hearing loss and I, I follow a lot of uh, people with hearing loss on Twitter. Twitter and uh, just to, to learn learn from them, right? What what are they talking about? Um, but I also know that sometimes putting putting the problem in a box also ends up putting the solution in a box, right? Mm. So why are we talking to different people with very different perspectives about similar issues? And I think it's because you know, as as human beings, we are. Um, there's there is lots of diversity right and that's exactly uh, the word that i thought about while recording episode three was the diversity in the audiences we're tapping into but what crystallized for me during the recording process was in speaking to renee it was completely obvious that even in the entrepreneurship space entrepreneurs as well are feeling this overwhelm and this overload So we're in previous times where I keep repeating to our guests that stat that as of June 2020, sensory overload was being searched over 40,000 times a month. The number itself is not the focus. It's the trend of an increase of 50% year over year. That knows no bounds. It knows no geography. It knows no demographic. Um, That is just true of the modern world. And so I thought it was actually really interesting to take this stance for episode three mix it up a little bit and talk about what Renee has seen and experienced uh, both personally and professionally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that really is exactly it. And I'll, you know, I'll bring it back to myself. If I only look for solutions offered by and shared by people with hearing loss, um, I'm, I'm missing out. I'm missing out both on understanding the, the, problem of sensory sensitivity and sensory overload and the and the possible solutions that are out there um, and that really um, makes me sort of uh, you know I, I actually want to hear from the audience and, the, and their thoughts about this about uh, finding listening to people where you go does this relate to me how does this relate to me and then there were just things that renee said um that really um that i'm like okay here's here's the thread right here are here are the uh the solutions or the thoughts or the ideas um that uh cross um, that are that are across the board. Um, one of the things she said, uh, she talked about boundaries, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and she talked about boundaries in um, just sort of managing daily life. And she talked about who who are you showing up for? Who are you showing up for at work? Who are you showing up for at home? 
And that really made me think to ask, when am I showing up for myself, mm. right, in all of this? Mm. Um, and I think, um, you know, with sensory overload, regardless as to the, the circumstance or the, the, the reason, right, um, for that, um, really uh, those understanding, putting those boundaries in place and, and um, is, is helpful, uh, but also uh, carving, you know, really carving out that distinction between uh, showing up, you know, showing up at, uh, showing up at work, showing up at home, and, but importantly, showing up for yourself. I, I had a, another conversation. I just happened to be talking to another co- occupational therapist today, working from home, and she's like, I'm, my office is in my bedroom right now. Like there are, I see the dirty laundry, right? And, and Renee yeah. sort of alluded to that. Like, where's the boundary? How do I focus, right? How do I, the things I see, the things we talk about noise and we talk about noise in terms of literally what we hear, but also metaphorically, just all the things coming at us, right? And, you know, if we don't, if we don't put boundaries in place, uh, it, it is overwhelming, Certainly. And one of the things that, speaking of boundaries, one of the things I've been eternally grateful for throughout the course of this podcast already is how forthcoming our guests have been with their personal experiences and their personal narratives. Renee talking about her son and his hyper awareness and sensitivity to things, but flipping the script a little bit and talking about the conversation around how that becomes his superpower. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just so honest and forthcoming of our guests to go there. And we just love talking about that and bringing, bringing those strategies and solutions to our listeners. Yeah. I, I really liked that uh, sort of along that thread of that uh, conversation that, um, you know, Renee said, again, she said, I really, that a, a label of, of her son being sensitive was really something um, that, what was a, a disconnect for her um, and finding um, finding a vocabulary to describe his hyper awareness uh, in, in a way that that fit for for him for her for their family and I really like she sort of um, it ended that bit of the that uh, conversation about uh, and I think tying it all together creating the environment that's going to work for you right creating an environment that works for her son that works for their family and that that is um you know such a yeah that was just a a, a real golden moment uh to hear that um yeah and to have that that emphasized yeah certainly crystal do you have anything else that really hit you on episode three i know we're going to get into the innovation segment for our listeners here shortly Maybe give us one more thing that landed with you. Yeah, the last thing, and, and, and Renee kind of uh, ended on this, um, that I think uh, really resonates with how we started this conversation about the diversity in conversation, the different people we're talking to. Uh, Renee sort of uh, left us with uh, the advice to be curious. And that, I think, um, when we're looking at problems and trying to find solutions, uh, and as I talked about, um, putting a problem or a solution in a box and finding only what immediately resonates, uh, that that lacks that spirit of curiosity. Mm. Uh, so I think as we you know continue forth in this series, really taking an uh, putting our mind uh, in a place that uh, makes us want to learn more and makes us be curious. Hello, listeners. Welcome back for the third segment of episode three of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast with Renee Warren. This is the innovation segment. This is the part where we help you with the tactics, tools, and strategies to manage sensory overload, to find sensory friendly solutions. And we're going to point you to a really special YouTube channel. This is by Peggy Bound Dentistry. In September, Peggy had the Sensory Friendly Solutions team, Crystal Seeberger, our CEO, 
Dr. Dilip Kasturi Rangan, who is a dentist and current MBA student with the company, to talk about their current research on sensory sensitivities in the dental world and how dentists can do better to provide for their patients. We want to hit multiple sectors here. We've talked about families. We've talked about autism awareness. We've talked about the social determinants of health. We've talked about entrepreneurship. In this innovation segment, we want to point you to a really special video talking about sensory-friendly solutions in the medical field. You'll find a link to the video in our show notes of this episode. Simply click the link and you'll be sent to YouTube to Peggy Bound Dentistry to see the Sensory Friendly Solutions team in action. Thank you to our sponsor, Taking It Global, ensuring that youth around the world are actively engaged and connected in shaping a more inclusive, peaceful, and sustainable world. As part of their Rising Youth Initiative, they're looking for young people who are inspired with ideas and ready to take action through youth-led community service grants. Head to risingyouth.ca to learn more and to become the next Rising Youth grant recipient. The podcast is also supported by New Brunswick Community College as part of the Community Resource Awareness During and After COVID-19 Applied Research Project funded by the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation. Learn more about NBCC's efforts to transform lives and communities at nbcc.ca. The Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast is produced by me, Matt George, is engineered by the great Zachary Pelche, and is part of the Unsettled Media Podcast Network.